Welcome, everyone. We are delighted to have you join us uh, if you're in Oklahoma on an icy evening. Um, uh, we, uh, it turned out, I guess, that uh, this being a virtual Da Vinci Institute Fall Forum worked out well, uh, at least in terms of being able to continue um, doing this event. Uh, as you know, um, typically, we hold the Da Vinci Institute Fall Forums at one of the member institutions campuses. And those are typ typically mid-afternoon or uh, mid-morning to mid-afternoon events. Uh, knowing how much Zoom fatigue has set in across uh, all of our lives these days. And indeed, that is one of the topics of our uh, series knowing that that is the case, what the Da Vinci Institute board decided to do for this year's fall forum was to hold a series of roughly one hour uh, Zoom broadcast events tonight through Thursday night. So certainly we invite you to join us um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday as well. There's no need to commit to the entire series and indeed you can come and go uh, however you need to during the course of each evening. But to give you a quick preview, um, tomorrow night, Tuesday, uh, we are very excited about having a guest speaker from California State University, Fresno, who has um, a great deal of expertise in working and teaching and learning at distance and in a pandemic environment in the visual and performing arts. Uh, and so uh, we look forward to that. It will uh, be unique tomorrow evening because it will be a single presenter. Um, typically, each of these evenings are structured as tonight's is with an opening segment, uh, then followed by a faculty member presenting a technological slash pedagogical solution uh, for these pandemic times and the teaching learning enterprise in higher education. Then Wednesday night, um, we'll have a focus on uh, STEM education in the pandemic era um, and are uh, very, very delighted to have um, Oklahoma faculty um, presenting. We will have Dr. Donald French from Oklahoma State University presenting the first segment. And then Dr. Jeanette Louch from University of Science and the Arts of Oklahoma presenting the technological segment. Um, then the final evening on Thursday, the focus there is on the liberal arts and education. And um, we're very delighted to have Dr. Martha Parrott from Northeastern State University and a couple of her teacher ed um, students who will be bringing the student perspective. Following that will be Dr. Thomas Horn of OCCC, Oklahoma City Community College, uh, who has some very um, wonderful solutions for teaching composition at a distance. And Thursday is very special because we will have a third presenter um, uh, from Cameron University uh, who will also be presenting about this topic on the liberal arts uh, education and faculty teaching in liberal arts. So that's a, a very quick preview of what's coming up this week. The Da Vinci Board is very happy and honored to welcome you um, to this opening evening's um, proceedings. And what I'd like to do at this time is to introduce Dr. Jody Horn from the University of Central Oklahoma, where she is the director of UCO's 21st Century Pedagogy Institute. Um, and Dr. Horn, um, is uh, it, her responsibilities include um, the 21st Century Pedagogy Institute, as I mentioned, but also the annual Fall Collegium 
uh, on college teaching practice. And um, she also plays um, the lead role in the Transformative Learning Conference held annually. Um, uh, the mission of the 21st Century Pedagogy Institute is to help faculty help students learn and to demonstrate faculty teaching effectiveness. After spending 16 years at a private university as a full-time faculty member and department chair, Dr. Horn decided to pursue her passion around student learning. And so because Dr. Horn is um, at another um, event this evening, she recorded her presentation by video and we're happy to share it with you now. And I will uh, follow up being able to stand in uh, for her with Q&A after some follow-on information. Um, I'm with the University of Central Oklahoma. I work in the Center for Excellence in Transformative Teaching and Learning. And I'm the director of the 21st Century Pedagogy Institute. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about faculty self-care and renewal. Um, first of all, I wanted to mention that this is a, this green screen I have with the picture is considered a greenscape. And there's eight or nine images that have been shown to reduce stress. And I'm going to share a few of those with you today. I'm talking about what I'm calling embracing the new normal. First thing I want to discuss is whether you've had, have you recognized your stress? Uh, many people say, well, I'm under a lot of stress, but they don't really think about, well, where is that stress coming from? And maybe if I knew where it was coming from, I could reduce it. Just seems like a general stress from all kinds of things happening. I'm going to talk about three areas today. One is the stress from teaching, uh, another is from family, and finally from the economy. So we're going to think about um, the stress related to these three items. What does, this, what does your stress uh, look like or how do you experience it? Many of these um, symptoms could relate to either teaching, any of those, teaching, the family, or the economy. Uh, one of the most important sources of Stress is the feeling of lack of control. Um, with the coronavirus and the pandemic, as well as the um, political unrest, um, lots of people feel like they lack control because they don't know what's going, to, what's going on. Um, and because they're fearful of either catching the virus or someone they love catching the virus. Um, and all everything surrounding that uh, relates to um, a great deal of stress with uncertainty. Now, the next area is the lack of resources. There is stress related to this also. There are people who have children and the children are not in school. So a faculty member might have to, they're preparing or even teaching their courses on Zoom, as well as helping their child try to get through their courses on uh, Zoom also. So that creates a lot of stress. And another source of stress is the lack of skills. There are lots of new skills needed that many people or many faculty haven't had time to um, perfect or even really know how to work. And that is related to technology, cameras, uh, multiple screens, um, when the students turn things in, all types of technology. Um, it's possible that faculty um, don't have the skills for that yet. And another area is burnout, uh, Zoom burnout. If you've been on Zoom multiple times during the day, that can create a lot of stress also. So these are some areas uh, you might want to think about and think, well, maybe I have that. That's where some of my stress is coming from or that other sources where I haven't thought about that before. So. What might the new normal be like? Many people argue that um, there is going to be a new normal, that even when the virus goes away, we're probably not going to go back to the way we had life before. Um, the new normal um, might involve lots of things like um, technology, 
before we move ahead, I wanted to point out that this is another image that can reduce uh, stress, a blue screen. But let me look at the new normal. The new normal might involve less face-to-face -face communication, um, more technology, more synchronous teaching or asynchronous teaching, more platforms that you might have to learn, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, more social media that might be involved, or in more of the unexpected. Seems kind of uh, ironic, but we, we're pretty sure that there's gonna be more of what we don't know, which will be a lots of stress in the new normal. Now, what is it, some things we can do that would help alleviate the stress? Before I begin, let me point out that this uh, picture of crumpled up paper is uh, a fractal, and these are also ways you can reduce stress by showing pictures similar to this. So related to the self-care, the uh, first thing you might think about, well, I think would probably be a good idea, is to identify where your stress is coming from, and then to proactively practice um, strategies that would reduce stress. Uh, many people, the APA argues that you should practice patience, graciousness, and compassion. And the idea is that as you practice those with other people, other people will practice them back to you and the climate will be, it will be a much friendlier climate that you exist in. You can also practice various forms of meditation. Um, I myself used to carry my cell phone when I walked, and now I never carry my cell phone. One of the forms of meditation I've read about is by walking and observing the uh, whatever you see, observing the nature and just being in the present. The final idea here is to bookend your days with gratitude. They suggest that you wake up thinking and thinking what you're grateful for and in the days similarly. Okay, some more ideas. Um, we have this, this is another image. This is a cute image. And this is one of the images, this is one of the images that has been shown to reduce stress. If you have a, something that you consider a cute image. Um, okay, other steps or strategies, things to think about that would help reduce stress. One thing is to recognize that all problems will not be solved. There will be some problems that they're just going to remain there. Um, the next thing is to uh, recognize that you can take small steps that you know, and that leads to the feeling that you are in control. Take small steps doing something that you know you can complete. Um, stay connected, um, contact family, significant others, uh, relatives, friends, stay connected to people. Um, activate positive emotions. Carry a little card around that says things that are positive that you can remember to say to people. Seek meaning in your experiences. Uh, think about what's happening to you and seek meaning in it. Seek positive meaning in it. And in, finally, with your syllabus, you should anticipate stress and plan. So, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the ways in your syllabus Go through your syllabus and think about what might go wrong. For example, you might have a student who can't upload a paper, or you might have a student whose internet doesn't work that day. Anticipate these problems and try to address them up front in your syllabus, um, explaining to the student alternatives if these uh, problems occur so that you're not uh, bombarded by uh, small problems from lots of different students. Another area, um, this is another area where um, the image is shown to reduce stress. This is, uh, if you have any architecture with patterns in it, that has been shown to reduce stress. Some of these ideas are related to uh, physical issues. Move your body to reduce stress, uh, walk, exercise, just move your body and anything with that. Make sure you have enough sleep. Uh, sleep extra during times of stress. Make sure you have something healthy to eat, nutrition, hydrate, and take small risks. Take small risks that um, you feel like might be beneficial um, in making you feel better if you can achieve them, but take small risks. 
And finally, uh, this is the final the, uh, image I want to share with you. It is a seascape. Um, and they um, argue that a seascape has been shown to reduce stress, any type of seascape. Other ideas that um, I'm putting forth are plan breaks. Plan breaks uh, in your home as well as um, during a class. You, want, you might be working on a paper or you might be working on courses. I mean, you need to plan breaks throughout the days, throughout the weekend. So you might say, okay, I'm going to do this for an hour or two, then I'll have 30 minutes. And the, those 30 minutes, you can do whatever you want. Um, plan breaks throughout your uh, work time. And, and this, similar to that is plan your entire day. That might help reduce stress. Um, they also suggest embrace learning, embrace the um, unpredictability of what's going on and see if you can learn some things. Be open-minded related to being adaptive, being flexible, be open-minded to something that has never occurred to you before. It's a possibility that um, these things could change. Rethink the past. Don't think about, um, this is the way things have always been done and I need to work toward making them the same way. Think about the future, think about what you need to um, achieve and maybe there's a different ways to do that. And the final one is to welcome adaptation. Welcome flexibility. Be willing to be flexible. Thank you very much for sharing with me. Well, uh, we appreciate uh, Dr. Horn putting that um, video together for us. And uh, as she went along, I'm sure you noticed some things um, based on the research that she has done regarding uh, stress relievers um, connected to the kinds of images uh, that you can focus on. Uh, one of them that she mentioned, uh, the forest scapes. Several years ago, there was some research done at the University of Michigan with students there and test performance. And in that research, um, what the researchers were trying to determine was whether walking in nature uh, shortly before exams would improve performance compared to the controls of not doing that and remaining in a non-nature environment to the degree that I suppose certain environments are less nature than others. And indeed, the researchers did find that a walk in nature um, did help improve students' um, test scores. Uh, Jody had mentioned the idea of not walking with her phone. The uh, research around that concept is that obviously our phones can be great sources of stress uh, and we are um, drawn to check them continuously, which can be stressful in itself. And so one of the recommendations is to simply put your phone away when you take a walk, even if it's across campus from the parking lot to your car, so that you're able to focus on the tree that you're passing or uh, some, other, um, uh, some other thing in your visual field because in the absence of that phone tugging for your attention, it gives your brain a better chance to glide into more of an appreciative, mindful state. So it's just a good rule of thumb to do some walking without uh, your phone out um, looking at that screen. Um, many of us obviously are aware of eye strain which contributes to stress, and um, certainly electronic screens um, contribute to eye strain, which contributes to stress. So many of you are probably familiar with the uh, very good advice to get off of screens at least an hour before you go to bed, um, uh, because it will help um, with melatonin um, and circadian rhythm uh, to allow you to better be able to fall asleep. But eye strain is certainly another thing that contributes to stress. 
And regarding Jody's advice about the seascapes, the seascapes very typically might include a horizon line. And when you focus on the horizon line, that is relaxing for your eyes. Um, many times um, people suggest, researchers suggest, that if you're working at your desktop all day so that your visual field is only 12 inches, 18 inches in front of you, um, that becomes straining over time for your eyes uh, and you can relax your eyes, rest your eyes. If you have, for example, a picture of mine happens to be on that wall right there of a seascape with a horizon line and you can rest your eyes by focusing on the horizon line. Another tip for faculty as they're working in stressful environments in their um, offices sometimes when they spend so much time in front of their computer screens. I'll finish off this first part by um, doing a quick screen share because um, what I uh, want to um, be able to show you here is um, a place where you can take advantage or places where you can take advantage of uh, finding some of these uh, kinds of images that Jody was talking about. Um, if you don't know about Pexels, P-E-X-E-L-S dot com, uh, royalty-free um, images. And if, for example, we type in forest right here, um, what will come up are uh, wonderful images of forests. And this right here or this right here might be um, a nice forest image if you need one, uh, because as the research shows, forest images uh, can be relaxing. Um, another uh, is of these kinds of websites is Pixabay, P-I-X-A-B-A-Y. And if we type in Seascape right here, um, we'll get multiple images of seascapes. Uh, and certainly here, this is a beautiful one with a horizon line. Uh, and you can download these, um, you can save um, the picture as. Uh, it's nice to um, reward the photographers. You're able to make a, a contribution if you would like to do that with these types of um, websites. Uh, a couple, one other thing that I'd like to let you know about, just go to YouTube and type in Kaleidoscope. Um, this is the fractals. Jody had talked about fractals, the crumpled paper. Um, kaleidoscopes are built on fractal patterns. And so uh, you can find relaxing kaleidoscopes at YouTube. And then finally, you can also find um, other uh, kinds of uh, fractals. If you type in fractals, for example, at um, uh, YouTube. You can get fascinating images that you can just kind of um, vegetate into as you watch these play across your screen. It's very, very uh, relaxing. So I did want to share this information with you um, uh, on the heels of Jody's presentation. So at this point, let me stop my sharing um, and we have two mechanisms for people to ask questions. If you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A panel, uh, and that specifically uh, is a good place to do it. And we see that Audrey Smits has her hand raised in Q&A, um, or it uh, might be in chat, um, but um, uh, we invite questions about this first segment of our um, of our presentation this evening uh, and I'll be able to stand in for Jody at least a little bit um, uh, to be able to potentially um, answer a few questions. 
Um, uh, while we're waiting for any questions that might um, uh, come in, please notice that our moderator, thank you to Mark Walvoord at the University of Central Oklahoma for moderating. Mark has been posting some questions to all participants to get some good uh, back and forth. And you'll notice the Pexels and Pixabay um, URLs are there uh, for you to copy and paste or hot link to. Um, and uh, you can um, type in questions into the Q&A um, uh, and, and uh, that might be a good way for us to manage this. Uh, so if you, if you have a question, uh, type it in and we will watch this um, to share. Uh, I will give you a preview of what's coming up. Uh, Brad Griffith of the Oklahoma State Regions for Higher Education will introduce um, the broader segment of this idea of technological solutions uh, each night. We'll have, um, we'll have a presentation about that. And Brad will also introduce our faculty member who will speak about this this evening, um, Dr. Luis Montes from University of Central Oklahoma. Um, and so, Audrey, um, if you have a question, you can type that into chat. I saw your hand raised a moment ago, um, and it might have been a, a behind the scenes tech question to get on board or something of that nature. Um, uh, if not, what I think we should do, oh, one other reminder, we are recording these. Uh, we're very happy to make these available after they become closed captioned. We will have um, a permanent URL where each night's presentations will be available. Uh, and uh, we will let our um, da Vinci board members know so they can share with everyone on their own campuses. Um, but also we are uh, trying to keep track of who our attendees are each night so we can communicate with them as well um, uh, about how to access these recordings um, after uh, we have them closed captioned. And that may take a few days, obviously. Um, so one of the comments um, uh, from Dr. Underwood, it makes some of us anxious to feel that we are not connecting with students on the other end. Um, any suggestions? Thank you for that question, Vaughn. And Jody and I did actually talk about exactly this because one of the sources for stress among faculty is that it is or can be so very difficult to gauge student engagement when you're at an when you're in an at distance environment, uh, maybe live streaming, something that's a little bit different from asynchronous online. Um, if you are actually in um, a, a quote unquote virtual live engagement where you can't see. Um, student facial expressions very easily, and certainly student body language, um, then um, it can be very anxiety producing for faculty not to know whether they have that connection. So some of the suggestions that have been made about this, one way is um, in this new environment, you literally have to plan ahead for um, much more frequent um, intentional prompts to your students at a distance. That may mean that you have to look at the material that you are sharing. You may have to chunk it um, such that after five to seven minutes, um, there are some logical questions that you, you can ask, feedback, prompting questions, and so forth um, that you present 
not just to your face-to-face -face students if you have this mixed kind of a setup with live streaming and face-to-face, -face, but to direct questions specifically to the students attending via live stream. One other piece of advice about doing this is that when you do so, don't be afraid of some wait time. Um, you may feel like if you're waiting for 20 seconds for some of those students that are attending by live stream to answer and you get very anxious when nobody chimes in, prepare yourself to simply wait um, because uh, it will eventually lead to some of those students responding. Um, uh, that issue of wait time is or has been researched a great deal in higher education in both the face-to-face -face and uh, live streaming environments. Um, you can see for yourselves in chat that uh, we have great suggestions from faculty attending this forum. Thank you all for um, participating with your own suggestions. And you see several of them. I'm, I'm seeing them as you all are in the chat. Um, and um, uh, Dr. Montez will be actually addressing some of this um, in his presentation coming up in just a couple of minutes. So um, I think that I have talked your ear off enough at this stage, and we've got some great back and forth in chat with suggestions. What I think we should do at this point is turn it over to Brad Griffith, um, who will be able to speak a little bit about just the idea of working with faculty who have come up with technology solutions. And then Brad will introduce Dr. Montes. Jeff, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, and I am actually not able to turn on my video right now, but I will do so just as soon as that is enabled here. Again, my name is Brad Griffith, and I serve as the Director of Online Learning Initiatives for the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education. I actually came to this position just one year ago, surprisingly, uh, coming from being a full-time staff member at the University of Central Oklahoma. So good evening to my former colleagues there. Uh, it's wonderful to see you on this call and to see the great work that you're all still doing at UCO. Uh, I do also continue to serve as an adjunct faculty member online. Uh, and I can also say as a faculty member, having taught fully online before the pandemic, students in every single modality are struggling right now. So uh, on behalf of the state regents and the groups that I oversee, which are the Council for Online Learning Excellence and the Online Consortium of Oklahoma, I would just like to express a note of gratitude for you all and everything that you do for your students to make sure that they are taken care of day in and day out and that their educational pathway does not come to a stop just because of what's going on in the world around us. Uh, so without spending too much further time on that, I would like to begin the introduction for our next speaker, which is Dr. Luis Montez. Luis is currently a professor of chemistry at the University of Central Oklahoma, where he has actually been a faculty member since the year 2000. Uh, Luis actually became the department chair of the chemistry area in 2012 uh, and also has worn numerous other hats at the institution outside of being a chemistry faculty member, uh, which includes teaching such courses as Success Central, leading such initiatives as the Hispanic Student Success Initiative, uh, and again, numerous other things that I've had the privilege of being involved with Luis while I was at UCO and beyond. One of the unique projects that we actually had an opportunity to work on about this time last year was a discussion of the beginning of this idea of teaching STEM or chemistry through mixed modalities. So uh, I can say about Dr. Montez, he has been a strategic thinker uh, concerning online instruction well before uh, it was absolutely necessary to be one. So I am truly excited to hear about what he's done and how he's progressed through this over the, over the course of these past couple of semesters. Uh, and again, it's a privilege to have been asked to do this introduction today. So thank you again, Jeff, and to the rest of the steering committee for Da Vinci Institute uh, for this opportunity. So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Luis Montes. Okay, um, I hope I'm sharing my screen. Uh, let me know if that's the right screen, PowerPoint. 
That's it. Okay, let me make sure I can see it as well. Uh, here we go. So I, uh, as Brad and Jeff has said, I'm at the University of Central Oklahoma. And I'm just gonna take you on a little uh, trip kind of that I experienced uh, in developing my teaching over probably the last eight years or so. And I would like to recognize right now, Jody Horn has been a part of that at our teaching and learning center. Uh, she's been instrumental. Uh, UCO is very uh, grateful to have Jody at uh, our university to help our faculty uh, through the, the 21st Century Pedagogy Institute and so many other things that she does. So what I have on the screen here on the title slide is uh, a screenshot of Microsoft Teams. And Microsoft Teams is the platform I'm using right now for what I'll call uh, communication aspects in my course. So we'll go ahead and move on to uh, I kind of tell you where I started out pre-pandemic. Um, as a chemist, I, I like to be very organized. I have a process for everything. I have a procedure for everything. Uh, and so I started teaching as I was taught, which means you know, you're lecturing. Uh, you might uh, ha ask some questions of students. Some students may jump in there and uh, give you feedback. But it was fairly neat and organized, kind of like these desks in the classroom. Um, and, and so I did that for a long time, probably from, you know, when I started teaching last century up until, you know, 2014, 2015, when I started talking Jody Horn a little more. And I saw an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed about a faculty member who had had their teaching and learning center person come into their classroom and take a minute by minute observation of what students were doing and what the faculty member was doing uh, from, you know, who, who's paying attention, who's reading a newspaper, who's on their computer, who, who's asking questions, uh, is there wait time, uh, is the faculty member using student names, lots of information like that. And so I thought, you know, this would be good to find out for myself. Uh, I'd always had good student evaluations. Uh, students said I was a good instructor. Uh, people would come to my classes. I didn't have to have an attendance policy and I'd get 90% attendance anyway. So I thought I was doing a good job. So Jody came to my classroom and she sat in the back and observed, even though she's not a chemist, but she could observe what I was doing and what the students were doing. And she made notes. I mean, she made note that I do use student names in the classroom. She made note of my very color-coded notes on the whiteboard. Uh, so that, you know, regular notes are in black, very important things are in purple, um, you know, the problems we're going to solve are in blue, and then we work them out in, in red, things like that. So everything was neat and organized, and there was actually good give and take between me and the students. But then we got into the details, and of the 42 students in my class, there was give and take between me and about eight students. So what are the other 34 students doing? Um, they were engaged, you know, maybe passively, but they weren't actively engaged for those 75 minutes in the classroom. So I talked to Jody and I'd already learned something about flipped classrooms. I had one former student with a video background suggest that I make uh, videos of my lectures because he was thought, he thought they were nice and organized. I could put them on YouTube and make a lot of money. So I'd already kind of dabbled in making content videos. But I decided to go ahead and take the plunge and convert to a flipped classroom. And so these desks are more reminiscent of what a flipped classroom would look like pre-pandemic in my class. Uh, of course, without the students, I couldn't get the students to demonstrate this today. Um, but we went so far as to get desks that are on wheels so that all of our classrooms in chemistry can, uh, the desks can easily be formed into circles so students can work in small groups. So that flipped format that I now employ pre-pandemic, uh, it had content videos that I produced that students would watch prior to coming to class. I would give them a one point video quiz before coming to class just to get an idea of what they understood, what they learned. 
And then their results on the video quiz would influence what I would talk about in class. I never had a prepared lecture in class. Uh, I don't even bring my notes to class anymore. Um, but, you know, if I see that students had a question uh, based on what they did on the video quiz, I could uh, direct my instruction to that. Or they could ask questions in class and I would answer their questions then. After that kind of question and answer uh, dialogue, give and take, uh, I'd form the students into groups and these groups are continuous throughout the semester. I form them beginning of the semester and they uh, stay with them the whole time. And they usually have 30 to 35 minutes at the end of each class to work in groups on a prepared worksheet based on the kinds of information that they're covering from the content videos the night before. And when I first, my first semester as a flipped instructor, um, I remember a colleague asked me how it was going. And I told her, you know, I'm not really enjoying it. Um, I was a lecturer, I enjoyed my interactive lectures, but I just don't know what I'm supposed to do in a flipped classroom yet. And it wasn't until after I had gone to a conference that semester and come back and she asked me how the conference went. And I said, I actually missed my class a little bit. And so that kind of stopped me and I got to thinking, you know, what was it about the class that finally caught on for me? And what I realized is that I'd found a new teaching identity for myself. Um, so I wasn't lecturing so much in front of everyone but that kind of stay connected that Jody said in, in her presentation, I found a way to stay connected with my students during the class time. And that was by wandering around between the groups, um, listening in on their conversations. Uh, they knew I was doing it. Of course, I'm not invisible. I'm wandering around the room. Uh, occasionally, they call me over to, you know, get some uh, confidence built in themselves that they're on the right track. And I, I would challenge a few of them to say, okay, you got that, can you do this? So I found a way to stay connected to my students even though I was not lecturing as much as I had before. And so since about 2016 or so, I've been pretty much only a, a flipped lecturer in our general chemistry classes. And I've carried that through to some of our senior level classes, which are smaller size, as well as a uh, kind of upper division majors elective uh, called the nature and development of chemistry. That's more discussion-based. So I've embraced that flipped format uh, as a way to stay connected. And the nice thing for me that this transition did is it got me more into an experimental mode and a willing to uh, welcome adaptation, as was said in the last presentation. And so that process in advance of the pandemic has helped me out. So what I found about facilitating group work pre-pandemic is that it really helps to make it worth points. And so the way I had, I had done that pre-pandemic is I had the students evaluate their other group members at the end of the semester. Um, in order to give them some uh, guidance on that, I developed with student input uh, some rubrics for that group evaluation at the beginning of each semester. So they kind of knew going in what their other colleague students, group members were expecting of them for positive group behavior. Um, I did have the students do a midterm group feedback where they could give their other group members information about how they're doing as a group member. Uh, it wasn't worth points at midterm, but I did encourage comments so that people could learn from what they were doing well and what they weren't doing as well. The benefits to this pre-pandemic, I saw that more students were actively engaged. Instead of just eight of the 42 being actively engaged, you could see that they were all somewhat engaged. Now, of course, in groups of, of six students, seven students, you're always going to have one or two who are a little less engaged than others. But certainly, there were a lot more than eight actively engaged. And the other thing is that students felt more connected to the course. I've always had good student evaluation scores, but after I flipped my course, my scores actually went up. And I don't think that was because of me. I think it's because they felt a connection to the course. And so I benefited from their, their connection, of, uh, their feeling of connection to the course. So what about group work in a pandemic? Okay, 
I'm still using D2L, our learning management system, for a lot of the things that I was using previously. I uh, have links to my content videos in D2L. And the nice thing about that is I can see who's accessed them and when they access them. I have the worksheets that students work on. Uh, those are available in D2L. And again, I can see who's accessed them and when. Um, I could also do things like require that they click on a couple of the videos before they access the worksheet. So I'm sure that they're getting the content before they try the material on the worksheet. Uh, students can turn in attendance reports in D2L. They do their video quiz. And now during a pandemic, they have a group quiz that they're doing as well. And that's all in D2L. And then what I call a quest is uh, a little bit bigger than a quiz, a little bit smaller than a test. And it's at the end of every chapter. So I call it a quest. And so during the pandemic, the students turn in the written to D2L. So I have adopted Microsoft Teams as my communication platform. So I do my synchronous lectures uh, through Microsoft Teams. Instead of Zoom, I use Microsoft Teams. Uh, that's both for the in-person as well as for the synchronous remote or extended virtual sessions. After my question and answer session, addressing some of the questions I had on the video quiz, then the groups work, uh, both the in-person and the virtual students work synchronously through Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft Teams has, instead of breakout rooms, they have what are called channels. And I set up a different channel for each group of students. And once it comes for group work, they interact through Microsoft Teams for their group work to answer the questions on the group quiz that's to do with it. Some of the students are virtual, but the in-person students bring their devices, uh, sometimes a laptop, sometimes a laptop and an iPad and a phone. Uh, it's amazing what they'll bring to class. They all have their ear pods or, or earphones. Um, and so the students who were remote still feel that connection to the classroom through the students who are in the classroom. I also use Microsoft Teams for virtual office visits. Um, the Teams platform is much more asynchronous than Zoom's is. And so students are able to contact me through Microsoft Teams. So I wanted to show you just a few different examples of group work and how the students uh, uh, interact with their groups in this environment. So this is an example of a team that only meets by video chat. They do not post any chat comments. Uh, if you look at reply, it doesn't say there's any replies there at all. But you do see the little circles for how many students were involved in the video conference. And this group, if you look at the times there, four minutes, um, they're very transactional group. They get in there, they answer the questions, and they get out. Um, so that's one kind of group. I have another group that's just the opposite, you know, multiple class periods. And if you look at here, they have 77 replies, but they're not doing a video conference at all. Uh, and the next class period, they have 53 replies, you know, these three people just chatting back and forth. So that's another way of doing it. But a third group is I want to kind of show off my, uh, my orange team. This is the team that uh, utilizes just about everything they can do. They do a video chat, but they also do text chats at the same time. And as you'll see, they also do emojis quite a bit as well. And I think that's something that as faculty, we should pay a little more attention to because this kind of uh, nonverbal communication that we were used to in the classroom through you know, who they're looking away, are they sitting up straight or slumping, their emojis are another form of nonverbal communication that can convey a lot of information. So this group, they start off, they're, they're asking about how they're doing. So again, they have a good connection to the class, to the group. Uh, they're celebrating someone got a part-time job. And then they go on. They're talking about fall break, so they're commiserating. Oh, we're all stressed. And, and as a faculty member, you could see these, and you really do learn a lot about how your students are doing. Um, and so that's always helpful. Um, at the end of the slide here, they're saying, I'm worn out already. Nothing left is more. The chat continues. They start talking about where's home. One of them's from Florida. Another one, you know, is from Iran. 
moved to another country, but now it doesn't have any family here. And so they all start saying in the next slide, oh, well, you know, come to my place for Thanksgiving, we'll feed you. Come to Christmas at our place, we'll feed you. Um, so there's definitely connection there. Uh, and then of course at the bottom it says, guys, I'm gonna cry uh, right now. Uh, and look at all those hearts and emojis there. So it's clear that some of these groups can have very strong connections, which are really helpful to have during these uh, stressful times. And so, you know, the, these chats continue um, and they are still trying to work. Uh, so they take turns sharing their screens to answer the group quiz. And so uh, MD over here is saying, I can try to, to screen share, maybe you can stay connected and, and you know, we'll submit the answers. Uh, I'm gonna join from my phone. So they're still trying different things. And of course, then they're still talking about food. Uh, what we, you know, tamales would be better than the turkey and funeral potatoes. And someone says, what are funeral potatoes? So someone looks it up and posts a picture. So again, lots of communication, lots of connection going on there. Um, they do get to work. Uh, so here we go. Uh, the highest KSP, the higher the solubility, right? So they're checking each other back and forth. Is this what you understood? And as you go through it, you know, it's not ideal chemical formulas, but you get the point across, they can communicate. And on the right-hand side, you see all the thumbs up. So they're reinforcing each other's answers with those emojis there. Uh, and then they do things like this, which I'll just blow up in this screen, where they'll screenshot how they're solving a problem for other people to, to see what they're doing. So even though they're not the main screen share person, uh, they can still communicate what's going on and how they got to their answer. So what I found some of the pros are for working in groups with Microsoft Teams, uh, students are generally communication. They're pretty comfortable with uh, text communication. They're really comfortable with emojis. Um, I think there's a lot more group members actively involved now than there were pre-pandemic in my groups. Um, the groups hold each other a little more accountable electronically than they did in person. I think just being in person, it's hard to challenge another person. But when you're electronic, you know, you could prod people a little more gently and it's not quite as offensive. Again, screenshots and screen sharing are very easy to do. So you know, when you have seven people in a group, it's hard to, you know, throw your paper all the way across the group to show someone, but screen sharing, it's pretty easy. And like I said, the, the faculty participation observation is really easy in Microsoft Teams as well. Um, there are some cons. Mobile platforms are less ideal for following the chat with the video conferencing. Um, so iPads and mobile phones, it's not best. And if students are using Microsoft Teams, it's best that they use that by downloading the software. Uh, that's probably the best way to do that. So uh, group work in classes, both pre-pandemic and during the pandemic, it has increased engagement with the course material. And I think it's clear during the pandemic that it's really fostered student connection to the course, as well as fostered student connection to other students. And it's fostered student connection to me. And honestly, I got my PhD so I could teach chemistry. That was part of my identity challenge when I shifted my teaching formats. Uh, but I worked that out. And so I think anything that helps us stay connected to our students and help our students to stay connected to each other is going to be something that we should consider carrying with us forward um, after we work through this pandemic. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing now and I'd be happy to answer any questions or comments that anyone has. Um, uh, thanks so much, uh, Luis. Uh, really, really appreciate that great presentation. And um, Dr. Susan Scott does have a question for you. Um, and I'll just read it from chat. Um, it's an interesting one. And then a follow up. Um, she'd like to ask if um, the in class students have trouble hearing other students through their earbuds. Um, maybe they're picking up radio waves or something else or their mics, is it a big problem? Uh, that's a big problem with Zoom. Is that an issue with um, Microsoft Teams? Um, it really depends on their systems. 
and, and occasionally I do hear a student say, we can't hear you, or occasionally like, like that one group had, someone has trouble sharing a certain screen. And so they ask someone else to share it. Mm -hmm. um, but since they're working groups the whole time, they figure out, you know, who has what technology. And so they're able to, you know, if this group member works better through chat, uh, the group makes sure that they pay attention to the chat. If this person, you know, is mainly over video, then they pay attention to the video too. So, so the students have actually adapted uh, very easily to this kind of uh, platform. Yeah, and so the chat uh, is actually through Microsoft Teams then? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Great. Um, a really, really interesting question. Someone's very interested in your shift in teaching identity. You had mentioned that and um, just eager to find out a little bit more about that. Um, I, I'm doing more writing about that. Um, I, I submitted a chapter to an American Chemical Society Symposium Series book that I, I introduced the idea, idea of a teaching identity change in that chapter. And some of the reviewers really picked up on that and wanted to learn more about that. So I'm starting to think more about what is our teaching identity and how it uh, influences who we are. And I think that's actually part of the stress that faculty feel right now with the pandemic is they're having to change what they're doing. Um, and maybe they haven't talked with someone like Jody Horn or Jeff Keen to help them realize that not necessarily how you're doing something is important, but why you're doing it is really the core of your teaching identity. And so once I struggled through that myself to understand that, you know, transitioning from, from a lecture approach to a flipped approach, it wasn't changing what I wanted to accomplish or why I was teaching. It was just changing the nuts and bolts of how I did it. So how you build that teaching identity and how you alter your teaching identity, uh, that's a serious issue. And I understand that's why a lot of faculty are, are very stressed right now because of that shift in teaching identity. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, we will be happy to share out uh, with everyone um, information. When you have published articles, let us know. <laughs> mm -hmm. That sounds like I'll do that. Uh, sounds like the kind of thing that many people in higher ed would be interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got one question just um, in terms of some of the nuts and bolts technologically uh, uh, here at our university with Microsoft Teams. Um, it's not an issue for the students being charged extra to get access for Microsoft Teams. That just comes as part of being a UCO student. But um, have you noticed that certain students struggle more often, maybe because you know they only have an iPad, not a laptop, or they happen to be um, uh, in a scenario where they don't have good internet access at home. In other words, maybe the best way to ask the question, is it a level playing field for the students? Um, for, for my class, it's worked out to be that way. Um, there are some students who prefer to be on campus because we do have better Wi-Fi on campus. Um, but at the same time, when I'm teaching in class, uh, projecting on the screen for myself and the in-class students, I'm projecting the, the class uh, chat, basically. Mm -hmm. And so I, I actually am logged into two devices. I'm logged into my iPad and I'm teaching on my iPad instead of writing on the whiteboard because the remote students can see the iPad writing more clearly. And so the students in class are seeing that projected on the screen along with the chat. Um, so they could see what other students are chatting. And in STEM, we tend to be a little bit competitive with each other. And so I always play off a little competition between the in-class students and the remote students in terms of who's gonna answer this question first. Um, and, and I play up the, you know, the voting up idea. So someone suggests an answer in chat first, so let's see who votes that up. Or someone else su suggested an an another answer, so let's see which answer gets voted up first. Uh, just to see where the class is. So there are ways you can use that non-verbal kind of communication, um, but you do have to involve your remote students as much as you involve your in-person students. And again, that's a bit of a teaching identity change. Instead of looking at the students in front of you, you have to look at the chat on the screen as well. 
Um, it's not natural, but you know, I've been doing it for what, 10 weeks now, 11 weeks now, and, and I'm getting used to it. So it's just something that, you know, you welcome adaptation as was said in the last presentation. And just curious, uh, out of curiosity, um, uh, the emojis that the students use, uh, you've seen enough of them across so many weeks. Um, do they have a set that a set of emojis within Microsoft Teams? Are they able to go out and grab their own kind of emojis? And here's an interesting question. Which one pops up the most? Is it just the thumbs up or what are you seeing emoji wise as the language in this new pandemic pivot? Um, thumbs up are certainly popular because that's, that's you know, that's a mm-hmm, uh-huh. It, it's a, I'm paying attention. I got you. I heard what you said. Um, you know, some groups hearts are pretty popular as well, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the groups that, that feel a stronger connection to each other. Um, but some of these students do find emojis everywhere else. Teams does have a set of, of standard emojis, you know, different faces, sad, happy, you know, shocked, scared, etc. But some of these students, uh, I don't know where they get them, but they get them from all over the place. Uh, I, I've told some of my students I have to up my emoji game because, you know, I'm lucky if I can get a smiley face uh, on, on a chat that I have. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Montez, for sharing this. It's been absolutely fascinating and very helpful in terms of um, observations about how you adapted and adjusted to um, the, new, uh, the new normal, I guess. Um, and a final question for you, um, who knows what's in store uh, in the future, but let's say that it could be possible for fall 2021 to be a completely pre-pandemic normal. If that were possible, would you still be doing many of the things that you're doing now that you um, took on in order to teach in this current uh, scenario? Um, I don't know if I would use, be using the technology if, all, if I had 42 students in the classroom again. I don't know if I would require the technology, but I would be much more intentional about uh, forming the groups. I think as, as I observe the groups more, I'm learning more about how to build teams that work. I know there's a lot of teaching and learning centers that have talked about building groups and building teams. Um, so kind of asking the questions about, you know, do you want to be recognized in the middle of a group? Do you want to speak up? Um, you know, are you just there for the transactional information exchange or are you there for a little bit more? Um, the one group that I, that I highlighted, uh, there's one girl in the group who she's always the first one to say hello. She wishes everyone, you know, good luck on your quest the last class period before. And she'll post a few things asynchronously out of class as well, just to, you know, encourage people. So there are students like that who make a difference. And so what I'm looking at now is trying to understand what really makes those in-class teams work um, that maybe they didn't work as well before. What are kind of some of the prods and prompts that I could give them to make sure that they're more actively involved in their in-class groups? Excellent. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of the Da Vinci Institute, we appreciate your um, excellent contribution this evening. And we certainly appreciate all our attendees joining. Um, just a quick reminder, uh, same time, same bat channel tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Uh, and we will uh, have um, a very, very fascinating presentation regarding um, virtual and performing arts education in the age of the pandemic. So thank you all for your attendance. And we look forward to seeing you um, in other of these events across this week through Thursday. Good night.